Meanwhile, I um, became a, a young professor here at uh, the university. The uh, colleague, a very traditionalist colleague in the sense of historical uh, anthropology, let's say, uh, who was there before me, he died when I was almost out of a job as a researcher. <laughs> uh, that's, well, how it happens, of course. So they took me in as a part-time uh, professor to begin with, and I continued part-time as, as a researcher. Um, and afterwards, I mean, rather quickly, I had to choose and either become full professor uh, or <coughs> stay a researcher and, and maybe drop the, the, the teaching. So I decided to uh, become a full professor because I think I had a a story, let's say. I had a storyline at least. And uh, well, did, uh, did several other things, uh, continue to do several other things along the line, these, these philosophical themes, let's say, uh, with my fa inclinations uh, there. Uh, this meant, for example, that um, on coming back from the field even the first time, uh, people started asking me, of course, when, uh, yeah, is it still worth it uh, to study these other cultures? Because at that time, 70s, 80s, uh, people still believed, a lot of people, lay people still do, I think, but more informed people won't, but well, uh, the general attitude was, you know, these cultures will die out. Uh, before that time, in 40s, 50s, uh, Boas, uh, founding father, let's say, of American anthropology, had a similar uh, idea. Uh, he, he thought that they would die out and so we should study them uh, as quickly as possible because they would, before they would die out. Now we know that this is uh, a fiction. This is not true. It will not happen. I mean, they change all the time just like we change all the time. I mean, look at us. Me, for example, coming from Antwerp, uh, being a filthy, small, provincial city at the time and who had to boom because of big money etc and then you become a different person over time I'm not becoming a millionaire that's not my point but I mean things change people th change uh, we are Americanized in a certain sense huh? uh, every young person now has a uh, uh, an iPhone or, or something which has them stand in a different way in, in the world, of course, than, than I would have done in, in my youth, let alone my parents or grandparents. Uh, so your own culture is also changing all the time. We eat Turkish, we eat uh, uh, whatever. Uh, and of course, our grandparents didn't do that. Uh, now, have we become Turkish? No, but have we developed a taste for it? Yes, and you know. And the same happens with uh, these other cultures. The same happened with humanity in general over uh, so many years, so many generations. But we don't think that way, which was the beginning of my frustration there. We think as if everything started, everything serious, let's say, or definitive, uh, the way it will go, uh, it, it will be in the future, started with the Greek European thinking, and now we are at the f forefront of that, and the rest of humanity will follow. Think about the, the uh, uh, UN and the organizations like UNDP and UNESCO even started after the Second World War. Uh, UNDP, for example, st stopped thinking or stopped speaking about civilization and civilizing, which was the norm after, uh, f uh, uh, sorry, before the First World War. But of course, some people thought that this was maybe not a good example of civilized behavior, the Second World War, so they dropped this discourse and they started speaking until today about development. So these others, they had to be developed because we were 
developed this sort of idea on humanity. And we're still not rid of that. We're still thinking along these ways. As if, you know, these others, yeah, the poor guys, first, when we discovered them, we, the Europeans, uh, Columbus, etc., uh, we had discussions for a couple of hundred years by theologians on whether they would, these others, belonged in nature. They were natural cultures, cultures of nature. Uh, that's still Naturvolker in, in, in German and same in, in uh, Dutch, etc. That's the way of thinking about them for centuries, meaning that, look at the Old Testament, uh, uh, Adam and Eve were created, and of course they were differentiated from all the rest that was created because they had, or at least Adam had, in the beginning only Adam, they had a soul, bringing them closer to God and his world and away from uh, nature, which was all the rest. And the way to do, of course, with the way to act then, God said, is you, human being, you are different from the rest of creation and now you can use it. It's for you. Go, and go ahead and use it. So nature, in that sense, intuitively, of course, is sort of put in a different category because we're dualistic there. Ontologically, we're dualistic, basically dualistic. And in the beginning, and that's not strange, but it's important to, to realize that, to become conscious of it, I think, and it's still not deeply entrenched in our thinking now, today, European or Western thinking. These others belong there. They belong in nature with these two, three hundred years of theological discussion on, you know, how, in, are they human? Then we should Christianize them, because then they have a soul. If they're not human, but really belong to nature, then it's absolutely horrible to try and Christianize them, to baptize them, because, you know, then you will land in hell because you have baptized an animal, and you don't do that. And they, so they used these people in the beginning, as animals. They, they could work for us, they could, you know. In, uh, after 500 years of, of Columbus, we had this uh, idea of big festivities, you know, 500 years of Christian civilization. That was the idea in 1992. It was shimmered down a little bit because finally, after 500 years, can you imagine how, how long it takes to sort of overcome your own, yeah, uh, hubris, in fact, but it started becoming clear from uh, indigenous, to some extent, indigenous uh, historians and social scientists that these 500 years were not really so glorious. And you know the discussion on the Holocaust here, um, Second World War, and the discussion there in academic circles is now it was six million deaths and other ones another position, the minimalist position, says, no, 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 it's not six million, it's only, you know, a bit less, this sort of awkward discussion. But, you know, the same now is happening about the history of the, the Americas, the North and South America, you know, the 500 years of, of uh, civilization there. And you have the minimalists who say, you know, we should really think of at least 74 million deaths, okay? The maximalists say, no, no, 94 million. And in 500 years, this was a secret. Can you imagine? No, that's so shocking, it still is. I mean, it's not general knowledge, right? I don't know any television programs ab about that, for example. Also, in the beginning, the first 100 years or something, uh, four and a half, I think it is, yeah, four and a half million North American uh, Indians, Native American Indians, uh, Native Americans, were uh, used as slaves. Mm. Of course, there's about 11 million Africans imported afterwards, because these Indians died like nothing, okay? But they were using them as slaves, because, you know, they belong to nature, you could use it. We are the humans, we Westerners. And it takes a terrible long time to, to decolonize this way of thinking about the world, about other people. 
about humanity as a whole, etc. I'm always amazed how long it takes and what sort of denial is there and what sort of hidden knowledge is it and all that, that sort of thing. So well, <coughs> but on coming back from uh, my first uh, trip, this was of course also an attitude I found with my fellow philosophers here. So for example, I was in, invited there to, um, by a so-called humanist at the time here, <laughs> who uh, was a lot on television as a humanist, so-called. Well, uh, I was invited in, in a conference he was having here, a local conference, on, on uh, what he called uh, ethical rationalism, or ethical rationality. That was the idea, ethical rationality. So you should be rational in your ethical choices, that sort of thing. And my uh, little piece said, well, you know, um, whatever uh, you think of yourself, this is extremely one-sided. Uh, I didn't find, I, I, being trained as, as a moral scientist, of course, I was looking for discussing this with uh, people whenever possible. I didn't find this, this uh, uh, let's say, culture or, or ethics of guilt that is so typical of our tradition. So you feel guilty and you know you sinned in, in, in that sense, eh? this, this whole uh, notion. And, and then you can uh, go and uh, look for a compromise in order to overcome your guilt. A lot of our law system, of course, is, is along these lines. You can buy yourself out, so to speak. You can compensate. Look at what's happening with the colonial discussion and now, also how to compensate. Yes, but how not to do that sort of thing, okay? How to allow, because I didn't find this guilt uh, morality, let's say, or this guilt system uh, with them. Uh, and then this, this, this same uh, philosopher, he, he uh, almost attacked me. I said, that's impossible. It's pan-human, it's universal. Eh? When you do something really wrong, and then his example was as, as Catholic as you can imagine, when you, for example, sleep with the woman of, you know, your, your best pal, that sort of thing, then you must feel guilt. I say, no, I'm sorry. People don't reason like that. They don't work like that all over the place. Probably two-thirds of humanity don't work that way with the guilt uh, morality. I said, no, that's impossible. And, and he went on. You can't convince a person who's so, you know, <laughs> self-indulgent, uh, yeah, if you like. He went on and he said, you know, but come on, if you confront an Indian with such a fact, such a misdeed, I'm sure he colors red. Officially, that's what he said. I said, uh, dear colleague, I think we're going to stop the discussion, right? Did you hear what you're saying? An Indian is turning red because of guilt? Did you hear what you're saying just here? That's the level that you end up with. I said, why can't you, you know, allow to at least doubt your own categories, deep categories, I can imagine, yes, they, they date, you know, date back for 2,000 years maybe, but we're just humans, like the others are just humans, and probably with enough difference so that you have a diversity uh, in, in total, no, that's impossible. There should be, you know, we have been for, for hundreds of years, we have these universalia, so these primitives can't, you know, this sort of thing. Shocking, shocking. <laughs> and he, on television, the big humanist, I think, there's a lot of work here. I mean, how is this possible today? But it's still there. It's, it's, it's uh, well, so one of the, the, the effects of this is that uh, I turn more and more I mean, apart from the purely academic work, let's say, there's this specialism on, on uh, mathematics and, and uh, mathematics education, really, and, and um, cultural backgrounds, uh, the, 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 the relationships, the complex and varied relationships, I think, between these two, if you can uh, look at it this way. Uh, I started more and more, certainly after the fall of the Berlin World there, the wall there uh, to, to address uh, societal uh, issues, uh, public issues, uh, also because 
uh, with the, the, the change, the international, maybe I have a feeling for that sort of thing, I don't know, uh, but at least I thought that this was an important shift happening. Uh, uh, the West claimed an, an, a new status. First, Fukuyama uh, at that point in 1990 said, well, that's the end of history, we have won. So the Western view on the world is the view on the world once more, but now it's official because the main enemy, uh, after the Second World War of course, the main enemy is defeated, the Soviet Union is dismantled, it's okay, everybody will now become what we are. Very funny. And then you had immediately after uh, him, uh, from Harvard, the same uh, uh, University, of course, where uh, Kissinger at that time, Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs, was coming from as a politician, uh, international politics. And his, one of his colleagues was Huntington. Uh, and he, uh, Samuel Huntington, and he launched this, this idea of, of uh, what is now, I think, known as uh, cultural identity polit politics, uh, saying that uh, we will stop. Uh, or we'll, we will leave the, the era of, of uh, social conflict, social <coughs> economic conflict, the workers against the haves, against the have-nots, and the workers as have-nots against the capitalists, this sort of thing. This is over and finished with, was his uh, point of view. What we will have now is cultural uh, identity, civilizational, he used the term civilization again for the first time, I think. Um, <coughs> uh, civilizational clashes, the clash of civilizations was his, his uh, book in 93, I think, 94. And uh, so I decided not on the basis of, of this book because I was busy uh, doing that, writing about this, I decided, well, I'm going to give back some of the insights that I think uh, one can gain from at least some uh, anthropological uh, work, anthropological uh, research. I'm going to try and translate this and give it back to my society, if you like. In, in this sense, uh, I'm going to write uh, well, some English and, and other language uh, books on, on the one hand, continue to do that, but on the other hand, uh, write in, in Dutch, uh, let's say essays that are abordable by a somewhat larger public, at, uh, at least. So I started with uh, Cultures Die Hard. It's the first uh, book along this line. But I say, yes, culture is important because the human being as such is not only... So I didn't formulate it that way in, in the beginning, but I would say that now with neoliberalism, it's very clear, I think. I, I attach this to the Huntington line, eh? this neoliberalism, uh, presents human beings as basically we are homo economicus. We are economic beings, economic agents, and that comes first. Clinton eh? uh, is the economy stupid, that, that sort of uh, mentality. This, yes, economy is important, but it's a little bit like the discussion on management. It's important as, as a means to satisfy, uh, in, a, in, a, in a convenient way, let's say, satisfy your needs. Uh, but already when you start thinking economically, and certainly within that uh, management thinking and market thinking, etc., already you, you, you made a couple of choices, and very important choices. They come before that. And as a human being, you're more than only this organizer of how to, to satisfy your needs. Uh, you have uh, religious, maybe mystic, uh, mystical uh, inclinations, you have aesthetics, uh, you have social uh, agreements and, and structures, etc. And you're all of that and much more. And not only economics, of course. But with neoliberalism, this, this was a very, very emphasis. emphasis uh, think of Thatcher. There's no such thing as society. That's quite a statement. It's saying stop all these other dimensions of human, of being a human being. We'll uh, skip that and go for economics only. And then economics of the able uh, individual. 
which is an extreme individualism, of course, uh, an, an extreme new uh, uh, inequality. That's Piketty, uh, the inequality with neoliberalism. The last, the, the past 30 years, there's a new and very, very sharp inequality of a new elite. Elite, some of it is the old elite, but certainly a new financial elite also, against everybody else. But new slavery, if you like, not officially, but you know, the, the, the one or two uh, uh, euro jobs, that sort of thing. Uh, people who have two, three jobs and don't really uh, have a good life, this sort of thing. I mean, that's not really what was civilized, uh, which is the first 30 years maybe after the Second World War, eh, the Le Rus Trantiem, as uh, Piketty says, when you had a serious attempt at least of redistribution of wealth. And a lot of people who look at my start, what I said in the beginning, uh, people from lower backgrounds had to study and had to maybe be able to have a better life. Uh, that was 50s to 80s, you know, this, this sort of opening. With neoliberalism, this is shut down again for the, you know, those who really make big stacks of money against everybody else with slogans like, greed is good. Can you imagine? Greed is good, and that's high civilization. An example for the rest of the world, I mean, what's happening here? This sort of thing. And that's the homo economicus uh, idea. So, and, and in Huntington, in fact, you have that already. That's our culture, he would say, and all the others, the Chinese, the Islamic tradition, and uh, for him also a little bit the Russians uh, still, uh, the, the Hindu tradition, they are the others. And you should look at a global scale, worldwide scale, and try and fix it in such a way that the others are uh, waging war on each other, literally war or economic wars, uh, where you get the profit from their conflicts. That's the model of, of uh, international politics, of world view, let's in thinking about the world according to Huntington, where he uses cultural identity, so our beautiful, unique uh, cultural identity of the Homo economicus in order to organize conflicts that may benefit for us, this sort of thing. Now, that's horrible. That's really horrible. But it's fashionable. Look at what we have been doing. Look at uh, one war after the other for, for oil, uh, mainly. Uh, look at the Bush uh, administrations, etc. Look at what it ended up in until now with, with uh, Trump and maybe the one who will come after him. Yeah? This sort of view on, on, on humanity, on the world, it's not gone. I mean, it it's looks like this is at least one important route and a very dangerous one, I think, personally, an anti-humanistic one, etc., which is, uh, well, a, a, a heavy uh, power still and a, apparently an attractive sort of position for the half then, for the elite, I think, uh, in the West. But if you look at this on, on the worldwide scale, it's horrible. It promises really endless conflicts, endless uh, more inequality, etc., etc. Okay. Uh, so that's why I started uh, developing these, these essays on how uh, the notion of culture and, and uh, the way of, of patronizing and, and, and uh, huh, even forcefully uh, sort of civilizing the others, etc., is wrong-headed, is stupid. You put all your money on one horse, uh, in, in the famous uh, metaphor, huh? uh, and this horse already is tired, I think. <laughs> After 300 years of capitalism, it doesn't seem like this is going to solve a lot of problems. It initiates some problems as well, so let's be a bit more modest and look at the whole picture and not say, you know, shoot off all the other horses and then we're winning. After all, no, maybe this horse is near death and if you shoot all the other ones, there we go, right? And this is what's happening now with the climate question disorder. So I think as an anthropologist, I can see this happening. I can see the uh, sort of ambition and on the other hand, the incapacity also uh, of this one tradition that doesn't really 
self-critically look at itself uh, and keeps putting down the others, the racism questions and the gender questions, all this sort of thing. A little bit of this is coming through now, which is good. It's coming through because I think we aren't the, the leading um, uh, political economic force anymore in the world. We probably were that, you know, since enlightenment and, and uh, industrialization, etc., up to global capitalism, but this is toppling. Uh, and you can see this, I mean, this is the sort of uh, inspiration, was a sort of inspiration for me. You can see this as ever since, again, the 90s, uh, that is the Somalia war. We were there in Somalia with the NATO. Belgians were there, they have a very good reputation. Belgians, because in no time they find the language to speak with others. That's the reputation we have from the Somali war for the Americans. They say, take along the Belgians because they will find the language. Yeah, okay. But this war was lost. The same with every war since. That's 25 years, 30 years of lost wars by the West, being the militarily the most important force in the world. But we can't manage to realize peace, to organize peace, which would benefit us. And that's a difference from before. In the 80s, we were still were able to do that, except for Vietnam, I think. But for the other conflicts, we were able to do that. Ever since Somalia, we didn't. It failed one after the other. Look at Syria, look at uh, Iraq, look at Libya. We can't solve Libya. I mean, this is nothing, nobody. And it's a disaster. It's pirating. It's, and we organize it, so, to call, so called. OK. So this is our situation now. And within that weakening, I think, of the superpower, the hegemon, you now get these uh, themes like the gender question, the race question, which come up again because there's room. The, the hegemon is weaker. So, which is, I'm, I'm not enjoying this, but I mean, this is happening, I think. And as an anthropologist, the more this hegemon thinks and praises and uh, shouts that our culture is superior, it's a, the more I think I'm involved to say, you know, what are you talking about? What's your notion of culture there? In Huntington, I made a criticism and I had uh, on his book, and I had the pleasure of uh, debating with him in, in Bookebers in, in Antwerp, which was horrible. He took me apart just before we had to, to go on the stage and said, I found nobody in Europe who is uh, a friend of the Turkish. Are you the first one? And then we went up. That sort of tricks her. What the hell is this person? But he was hailed and applauded everywhere by center, center right groups all over Europe and, of course, the neoliberals. So that's the predicament we are in now, where I think, as an anthropologist, if I have some authority, I must say, you know, the notions you're using is, is bullshit. It's not well thought through. It's pure ideo ideological what you're doing here. And that's a battle. But I think as an intellectual then, from my field, I can try and offer some, well, uh, other version, other story than the dominant one, which is still dominant and which is dangerous, I think. Look at extreme right developing all over in every election. Look at France, look at Holland. I mean, it's not an easy thing. And it's disastrous, to be sure. You can, you can just, you know, 